In the final lines of Paul's letter to the church of Philippians, Paul tells them that it was good that they shared in his troubles. The question that I want to answer from our text today is, why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? And when I say partner, I mean that's giving of your time and your thoughts and your energy and your efforts and your prayers and your finances and your resources and your blood, sweat, and tears. Now, for some of you, from the moment you first believed the gospel, you were all in, and you haven't turned back. The more time has gone by, the more you have read Scripture, the more of life you have lived, the more that you have been convinced that following Jesus is the true and the right and the good path. You have fallen more in love with Jesus and treasure Him more and more above all things and all others. You're in this room today, and I hope you will be encouraged and that you'll be strengthened by the passage we're going to examine. Now, for other of you who are in this room, you've been cautious, and you have um, kind of haphazardly or casually waded into the gospel and the things of Christ. You've been splashing around, quote-unquote, in the shallows for a while and perhaps for decades. You might get involved here and there in church or give something if you can or if you have extra. You will pray on occasion and read your Bible from time to time, and you have perhaps some Christian songs on your playlist. But you don't want to go too far or get, you know, carried away. I hope Today, you'll be convinced and find courage in the words of C.S. Lewis to go farther up and farther in. And perhaps some of you today are skeptical about Christianity. You're skeptical about the church or, quote, organized religion. And you don't know about religious leaders. I'm glad you're here. We see you and we are honored that you're here. And we're intentional about lowering barriers between you and the gospel. We look in this place to be transparent and open about our lives, about our goals and objectives, our values, our motivations, and of course, our finances. If you've been around here for a while, if it's your first day, it's hard to find where to give money. And we do that on purpose because we want you to be focused in on Christ. We want no one to think that we see them as some person who can contribute, but we want all people to connect with Christ, His church, and His cause. So, we're going to read our passage today, and again, if you do have a Bible, turn open to Philippians chapter 4, and if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you right in front of you in your pew, there will be one there, and you can turn to page 1013 as we look through these final words of Paul. I'm going to read them, and then we're going to circle back and look, uh, look at them more closely. So, here we are, Philippians chapter 4 starting with 14, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter and of the book. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Now, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. 
To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now greet all God's people in Christ Jesus, the brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you in spirit. Amen. By the way, there's nothing like turning of pages of notes. I heard that. I was like, that did my heart well. I work hard on those. (laughs) So, as we read, Paul opens this section by saying, it was good that they shared in his troubles. So again, the question we are looking to answer from this passage is, why is it good for you? Why is it good for me? Why is it good for us to partner in and with gospel ministry? We're going to find seven reasons from the text, and I hope you will be convinced And I hope you will be compelled to continue to partner and do more and more. So here's the question. Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? The first point is this. Because you are treasuring rightly. You are treasuring rightly. So I'm going to look at the first verse, I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to dive into it. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, they received it from Paul, when I, sent, when I was sent out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only." So these people living in a town or a city called Philippi received the message of the gospel, that they can be forgiven of their sins and receive new life in and through Jesus Christ. They heard this message from a man named Paul. Now, Paul gave his life and also risked his life to communicate the good news to the people. So people can be right with God and have eternal life. Now, Paul did this because he was convinced of the truth of the message. And he was called by God to communicate this message to places in which they have not yet heard. One of these places at that time was, again, the city of Philippi. And those people received and heard the message. They believed the gospel. Paul spent some time there and then he went on to other cities and other places to do ministry. Now, the people in Philippi, they chose to support the gospel proclamation in other places as well. And at this point in Paul's ministry, they were the only people, the only church that did this with him. So we have to ask the question, why did they choose to partner with gospel ministry? I'm going to tell you, I think they did this because they treasured the right things. There are only two things that will make it through to eternity. The first is this, the Word of God, right? The Word of God is going to continue to have authority and continue to have life and meaning and value. That will make it through to eternity. The second thing that will make it through to eternity is the souls of people. All of this stuff, this church, your cars, your income, all of that stuff, you are not taking with you. You will be there. You will face God. And God's word will stand. These things have eternal value. So these people in this place called Philippi, they treasured the word of God. That it came to them and it changed them. They also treasured the souls of people who had not yet heard. And they gave themselves to see this goal accomplished. They knew the value of the word, and they knew the value of 
people. So they got behind the work and supported it because this is what they treasured. They understood and perhaps saw themselves as mm, beggars who had just received bread and willing to point other people to that place. This was these people, and they understood this. Jesus said that where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. They treasured the surpassing value of the message of Christ, and they knew that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And they understood the logic that how will they call on him to whom they have not believed, and how would they believe in him who they have not heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching, and how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. They partnered with gospel ministry. They treasured the right things that kept them focused on what matters most. When we do that, when we focus on what matters most, again, which is the Word of God, which is the hearts of people, if we treasure these things, we give ourselves to these things because our heart is there. And it keeps us from being distracted and entangled by things that don't matter and also lesser pursuits. Jesus said, what good is it for one to be rich in the world but poor towards God? What good is it if we escape this world as one through the flames and lose our reward? It is good for you and I to partner with gospel ministry because it helps us to treasure rightly. Second, when we partner with gospel ministry, we are, you are, developing character. Okay, this is what I mean. This is Philippians chapter 4, 16. Paul says, For even when I was in Thessalonica, another city far away from Philippi, you sent me aid more than once. When I was in need. It's not how you start that matters most, but how you finish. And you say amen to that, right? Good intentions do not produce results. And perseverance, by the way, is highly valued characteristic in the eyes of God. So much so that God intentionally brings, God intentionally brings trials and tests and sufferings so that you and I will develop, here's the word, endurance. And through endurance, we will become strong and mature, full of hope, and that our faith will be proven to be true and genuine, which is of more value. Your faith is of more value than all the gold and all the riches and all the pleasures of this world. And I, by the way, have texts in here in your notes that you can look on these things. So you know that I'm not lying to you, okay? When you continue, continue to be engaged with what matters most, and you continue to overcome obstacles and be consistent, your character grows. Your faith is proved genuine, and the kingdom of God advances in the hearts of people. Focus on what matters most and continue until it's completed. They didn't say, Paul, just thank you and hope you have a nice time and God bless you. They, ra- they realized how important the gospel was, how important people were. They said, we are going to give ourselves to this. And they sent Epaphroditus and they sent other gifts at other times because they believed in this and they continued to persevere and they continued to give and they continued to express love. Because, by the way, real love perseveres, right? Continues to connect. It's not a one and done to clear conscious, it's expressing love by meeting needs time and time 
and time again. It is especially good for us to give to people that we love and trust and places that have helped us grow, places that have helped us understand the gospel. To those who are looking over our souls as they continue and then continue to give because it's good for us to do so and develop our character to be more like Christ. Why is it good for us to partner with gospel ministry over time and consistency? Because it develops our character. So, we're going to look at the next thing, right? And this Paul focuses in on this, right? Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? Because you are receiving credit. And this is super interesting. This is what Paul had to say in verse 17. Not that I desire your gifts, right? End of the letter. These people sent Epaphroditus. They met his need, and he's writing back to them this letter of Philippians. And he says, hey, hey, hey. And we know this from the previous passage at well, that he learned to be content. Now, did he have needs? Yes, but his primary goal was not to get his needs met. He said, not that I desire your gifts, not that I see you only as someone who gives to me. He says, what I desire is that more be credited to your, your account. So what is, what is this about, <laughs> right? So Paul's saying, hey, I have some needs, but this is an opportunity for you to invest in eternity, And when you invest in eternal things, gospel proclamation, the things of the kingdom of God, you will get a credit in your account. And he's talking about an eternal account. Now again, Paul indeed did have a need, and a dire one at that he needed to eat, he needed to be, uh, have clothing, he needed some of these things. But what he wanted more, and this is amazing to think about, more than what having his need meant, was that those who were going to give to meet the need would again gain a credit. Now this way is contrary to how we normally think and naturally think. We see a need, we meet a need, we have a need, we want to see it met. We typically don't think about what is happening when we do so from an eternal perspective. Now, here's the deal. Paul had trained his mind to focus on what matters most from the reality of eternity. Right? Let me say that last two words again, the reality of eternity. Here's the bad news. Shouldn't be a surprise. We are. We're all on the terminal, Lord. Okay. The truth is that you're going to be, quote unquote, dead a lot longer than your life, even if you live to <clears throat> 90 years old, right? What happens next? Jesus, of course, told us what happens next. The Bible is clear on what happens next. So Paul saw his existence in this body from the time he was physically on the planet through the lens of eternity. Jesus did the same as well. So much so, he trained his mind so much so that he gave his entire life, his blood, sweat, and tears, his time, his talent, his treasure, gave it for what matters most. This is faith. This is faithfulness. And Paul wasn't messing around. He was banking on eternity. And I want to convince you to do the same. Now, there's tons of scriptures that talk about this, and I have a number of them in our notes, right? Here is 
the teaching of Jesus. This is what Jesus himself said. And by the way, if you're going to trust anybody, trust Jesus, okay? It's one person who gave his life for you, which is him. And this is what he taught in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. This was, by the way, a promise. He is going to return. He's going to be coming back with His glory and with the angels. And then He will repay each person according to what he or she has done. Take that to heart. Well, you say, well, I don't believe in that. It doesn't matter what you believe, right? It matters what He says. I hope that impacts you. Jesus also said this, right? This is Matthew 10. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And the one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones those small in the faith, not necessarily a child, but someone who is just new to the faith, a cup of cold water, doing so because they are my disciple. Truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. God pays attention to your life, okay. pays attention to these things. Jesus also gave this advice in chapter 12 of Luke. He said, sell your possessions, give to the needy. Why? Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. With a treasure in the hearts that does not, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. He says, listen, exchange this stuff for stuff that really matters, right? This is good advice. And when Paul was in Ephesus and he was training this young pastor named Timothy, he says, hey, 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 Timothy, tell people this. This is Timothy chapter 6. He says, as for the rich in this present age, okay, and by, by the way, world standards, you are rich. Well, I'm on welfare. You are rich in comparison to billions of people. Do you have electricity that works? Do you have a cell phone? Oh, you do. Okay. Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have ability to have transport? It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them, number one, not to be haughty, that is proud, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, that riches are going to be the thing that takes care of them and, and treats them well and provides for them. It says, don't set their hopes on riches, but tell them Put their hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to what? Do good. To be rich in what? Good works. To be generous and ready to share. Verse 19, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Do you veer your life through these lenses? It's going to be a matter of time in which we are standing before Christ, according to Christ himself, according to the holy word of God. Knowing the teachings of Jesus and the reality of his promises and the sureness of eternity, Paul says he wants the people to give Not just that their needs are met, but more importantly, that they will get credit in their eternal account, which is the place of real wealth, the place that matters most. Do you see this teaching? What does that mean? What does that look like in eternity? I don't know the specifics, but I do know that it's going to be good, right? It's going to be better than even what you can expect. So in the light of this teaching, you are a fool to spend all your resources on things of so little value. When you can spend these things on what matters most and what truly will last and have eternal value and worth. 
Margie said this quote, again, by a guy named Jim Elliott. If you're familiar with him, he lost his life. Now, let's put it this way. He gave his life for the proclamation of, a, of the gospel. And him and his, um, uh, his fellow ministers were killed. And he wrote a journal, and in his journal, he did pen the words that says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Do you believe that? So, yes, pastor, I believe it. It's in the Bible. Do you live like this is a reality? Pastor, you are meddling right now. I'm trying to help you. This is what Jesus said. This are the realities of eternity. And again, you and I will be there in a blink of an eye. Are these things true or are they not? And if you believe they are true, then we have to take them serious. And if we take them serious, then we evaluate our life through this lens. That's why Paul says, hey, hey, hey. It's not, you know, thank you for meeting my needs, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what's even more important, that you gave, God knows that you gave, and it is accredited to your eternal account. So I'm giving you an opportunity for eternal investments, and I am overjoyed, Paul would say, that you are doing this because there is benefit and eternity that is taking place when you do this. You and I have opportunities to invest in the eternal word of God and the message of Christ, that it will be proclaimed and cultivated to all people everywhere. By the way, one of my primary responsibilities is to help you, as Paul said, live as Christ. Right? That's part of my job as a pastor, and if this is your church part of my job as helping us to live our life as Christ. That's why we speak from the Word. Also, part of my job is to help you die well. To die is gain. I hope the whole older you get, even though your body is not like it used to be, right? The older you get, I hope the more giddy you get. I am closer to moving towards my reward, not away from it. I don't want you to be a grumpy old man right? or a cranky old lady right? <laughs> longing for the good old days. Your good old days are ahead of you. Right? These are the best of all days. And so if you think through the lens of eternity, and you put your treasure forward, you anticipate what is to come with joy and gladness, to live as Christ, mm, but to die as gain. Right? It's better to be that way. So this is what Paul was doing. This is what I'm trying to help you do. When we get together on the other side of eternity, I hope you say, I'm glad we talked about this passage, right? And I'm going to say, so am I, right? And I'm glad that you gave yourself to the reality of what is written in the eternal word of God. Right? Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? Because this will be credited to your account. Now, another reason why it is good for you to partner with gospel ministry is that we get to make a difference. You get to make a difference. Paul says in verse 18, the first part, it says, hey, I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied. Now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent when you give, you're making a real difference in the real world. We're meeting real needs and making a real difference by 
shining and showing the love of Christ in and through our gospel ministry. There is satisfaction that knowing that your life counts for something. It gives you purpose and gives you power for each day. I don't want you when you um, become older, right? That the purpose of your day, the highlight of your day is going to McDonald's. Right? <laughs> it's easy to get depressed when things don't go well. I'm just telling you. Right? When my dad was alive, he was, went, went blind, or was, yeah, he went mostly blind. He had to go to rehab. And his life was a drudgery. Go to nursing homes, go to places, you go to people who have just lost their purpose and all they're really doing is just waiting to die. Right? Please live while you're dying. Okay? So dad, you've got to have a purpose beyond the evening news. Right? Get involved in something. Thing. Be involved in something that matters mirth most. If you have breath in your lungs, you have purpose from God. Right? Making a difference matters. When our kids were growing up, I'd often tell them this, and I still tell them this. Just this last weekend, sorry, this thing is driving me a little bit crazy. You guys, you guys, like, stop playing with that. Okay, I'm gonna put it down. Don't touch it anymore. Okay. I used to tell our kids to go mad. Literally, I say, hey, go mad today. What, like they'd be rabid dogs? That's not what I'm talking about. I said, make a difference. M A D today. Let your goal be you will make a difference today. And so if you set that as your desire, right? You set that as your goal, the only per per person that can stop you from making a difference is who? you. Go make a difference today. Somebody, somewhere, in some way, for the gospel and for Christ, make a difference. Now, if your goal is, I hope today is good, and I hope my crabby co-worker leaves me alone, okay? It's not a good goal. You know why? Because your success is dependent upon someone else. If your goal is, oh, I hope my day is easy and I can just skate on by, that's not a good goal. You just wasted your day. Right? But if you say, today, I want to make a difference in somebody, in some way, somewhere, for the gospel of Christ, for the goodness of God, that's the best way to live. That's why we do hard things. This has been ingrained in my children, and I hope it's ingrained in you. And they are doing hard things, going to hard careers, right? Not to make the most money, but to make the biggest difference. You understand this, right? This changes you. And when you help, it makes a real difference. When you give, kids in Kenya eat because of the glory of God and the goodness of His people, right? You and I have an opportunity to make a difference, as big or as little, but do this. Paul's thank them that he's been supplied, and giving helps us to know that our life is making a difference. That's why we partner. Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? The next one is, you are pleasing God. I hope that's your desire, right? In verse 18 of uh, this chapter, Paul says, they are, the gifts are, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, he uses the language of Old Testament worship, right? Where they gave of what they had, and they gave it, and Back then, it was an animal sacrifice often, right? There's, there's other ways that they gave financially and all this. They did this as a spiritual or as a way of worshiping. Paul is saying now in the New Testament, when you are 
giving to gospel partnership. It is a way of worship. Do you know that? Right? Worship doesn't happen just when we are singing songs or looking at the Word of God. Worship also happens at the offering box, right? This is an expression of faith. This is a way of honoring God. And Paul recognizes this, and when we do so, it pleases God. And whatever pleases God will ultimately be the best for you. Did you just hear that sentence? Whatever pleases God ultimately will be the best for you as well. This is called being a Christian hedonist, right? Following after Christ. Now, will it be painful now at times? Mm, Yeah. Will it be easy? Mm, Not always. Will you like doing stuff for Christ all the time? Yeah, most of the time, but not always. Does it please God? Yes. And ultimately, will it be best for you? Absolutely. Please seriously think about this and let it shape the way you think, which will in turn shape your choices, which will make a difference and now impact all eternity. Now, Paul, of course, over Scripture, urges us to please the Lord. The goal of a Christian is to be like Christ. Christ's goal was to honor or please His Father. So we, in turn then, as a Christian, our aim, by the grace of God, is to please God. And, and Paul writes in other places in the church in Thessalonica, he says, finally then, brothers, sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, do this, follow us just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Also in 2 Corinthians, he says, so, whatever, so whenever we are home or away, he's talking about being in heaven or being here, this is not our home. Whether we're here or away, we make it our aim to please him, God, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he or she has done in the body, whether good or evil. This, by the way, helps us in the bigger um, thought of fearing the Lord, honoring God, but also recognizing the God of all the universe who knows all things. We will stand in front of Him with no lawyer on our side twisting the facts and looking for loopholes. We're there as we truly are in the reality and totality of our life. I want that to be a good day, but a fearful day. This helps us knowing, God, I want to honor you. I want to respect you. I want to know you. I want to make you known. And if you say, well, I want to please God, how am I to do that? I'm going to tell you with crystal clarity, when you partner with gospel ministry, be it with finances, be it with energy, be it with time, be it with whatever you have, this pleases the Lord. And it is good for us to do this. Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? Because you are expressing faith. And this next verse is another one that I encourage you to memorize. And my God will meet all of your needs. Right? Circle that. According to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. And to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a promise. It'll help us to partner, recognizing that God is helping us. Us and God will and has and forever will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So, when you give, it's an expression of faith. Often, people don't give because they don't trust, or they say, Hey, I can't afford to give. 
Now, the issue isn't that you can't afford to give. The issue is that you're, tra- you're treasuring the wrong thing. Do you hear me, right? What are you talking <laughs> or treasuring? What are you talking about? What are you treasuring most? Do you believe that God will provide your needs? Yes or no? Ah. Well, I, I, I need to do this, and I got some stuff I got to do, and I got some stuff I want to do, and I'm yeah. Will God do that or not? Is he a liar or not? Is this a promise or is it not? Are we going to express our faith in saying that we will trust him and honor him? and worship Him. So when we give, it is an expression of faith. You want to know another promise that helps me a lot? This is Luke chapter 6. Jesus said, give, and it will be what? Given to you. Well, how much? Well, a good measure. <laughs> Compressed, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your laps. For with the measure you used, it will be measured back to you. Do you guys understand that? And this is not a get-rich scheme that prosperity preachers will tell you this, right? They'll give you this and say, oh, do this, okay? And people expect that, you know, they'll go from $10 to $100,000 overnight because they gave, right? When is this going to be fulfilled, This will be fulfilled primarily in eternity. Do you hear me? This is about putting things forward or paying it forward. Now, will God meet your needs? Absolutely. Will there be abundance? Yes, there. And do you trust Him for that? The truth is that you will never outgive God. Did you hear me this, right? Why? Because He's a lot more than you. (laughs) He knows a lot more. He has all resources. Part of this thing called being a part of this planet is growing in maturity, growing in faith, gravitating toward hope, showing that we love. And do you trust him? Then we have opportunity to show it. This is good for us. God, help us. Do you believe this? Why is it good for you to partner with gospel ministry? Because you make friends this way. Dave, what do you mean? Well, here it is. Verse 21. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus, the brothers and sisters who are with me, send greetings. These are people that the Philippians don't know and will never meet. Right? All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. People who more than likely would never meet each other in person on this earth sent greetings and love to each other. The love and warmth were shared because of the connection between them in the gospel and through the ministry of Paul. Because this church supported this one man, many lives were changed and connected for eternity. When you support, when you support gospel ministry, this is happening in your life as well. Jesus told us to do this. Right? This is kind of be like shocking to you, but this is what Jesus said. Luke chapter 16, verse 9. Now he said, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. <laughs> what? <laughs> Buy your friends? <laughs> no, he's saying, hey, listen. Use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, and it will be gone someday, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings, right? Think about this. So the people who lived in Philippi used their worldly wealth to, quote-unquote, gain friends. They built bridges and opened doors by supporting the work of ministry in impacting lives. One day, all the stuff you have will be gone, (laughs) 
And the most valuable thing that you can take with you is your connection and relationship to Christ and to others, which is forged on earth and will last for eternity. When you give to people you know in gospel ministry and people that you will never know because of gospel ministry, you open doors. They may not know who you are now and what you have done now, but they will know in heaven. And their doors will be open to you. Now, some of you give money to missions. And this is what I'm going to tell you. Keep doing it! You may never meet any of those Kenyan kids. You may never meet any of those people on this earth, and they more than likely won't know who gave what. I believe in eternity, all things will be seen clearly as they are. If you were given life-saving food, if you were given the gospel, like the shoe boxes we do in Christmas, you remember those shoe boxes, right? We put together these things, we buy stuff, and it's fun with the kids, and we send it off. Is it good for us? Absolutely. Those boxes go to places and put in the hands of people that you and I will never meet here. I believe that they receive the message and they receive the, the support. Of course, the doors are going to be open to you. Thank you for giving to the Lord. This is a good way to spend your money. Use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that there will be eternal connections and open doors. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 19, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands, why? To gain more money? No, for my name's sake. They will receive a hundred and will inherit eternal life. The many who are first will be last, and the last first. This world says the first place is the person who has the most stuff, right? We have a list that measures the wealth of people, right? I make $1.6 billion. Look at me. They're first. The kingdom of God is not how much that you have that matters. How much did you give? Right? What did you do with all of this? The pharaohs, they, they thought that if they were buried with all their stuff, they'll have a good eternity. Your stuff on this earth is not going to help you. Unless you've invested it in places that mean and matter the most. I'm going to come into a landing here. Right? I'm going to tell you a little bit. If musicians could come up, that would be great. I'm going to tell you how this works in, in, in our life. Okay? This is how it works. I really came to faith when I was 17 years old. I was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. I was convinced that what he says is right I read the New Testament and I was convinced and I believed and God started to change me, heal me, transform me and I'm still in that process. I saw an opportunity to give and I saw an opportunity to tithe and I was working at a gas station making $3.50 an hour. Yes! Pay for my own gas, pay for my own clothes, pay for all of it, right? Did they not grow up in wealth at all, right? I said, God, I believe and I trust you. And I started right from the beginning, 17 years old. Not because I was a pastor, not because I was part of a church. I said, I'm part of the kingdom and this is what it says and I believe it. So I started to give. 17, right? That hasn't changed. It was a non-negotiable. Even when we had two small kids and I was working for the tremendous sum of $7 an hour, right? painting houses and doing things, right? 
There are times when we were starting uh, the church that became now Cross Point. That we had to work, I had to work four jobs, by the way, <laughs> four jobs. Working with Tom Klonicky, our drummer, doing construction. Working with Rob Petrie, who is here, running video cameras for Rock Valley. Working for an auctioneer to try to gain some money. And working for the church about a day a week. Had two kids at home. Had a wife that we committed to uh, be at home to help raise our kids and homeschool our kids. We took on our niece to take care of her. And we had a dog, right? <laughs> and we continued to support children from Compassion, giving them money every single month. We committed that when our kids were tiny, right? We always sponsor boys because we have girls who say, you know what, we're going to make a difference. We continue doing that for a day. I'll never beat those kids face to face here, but I'll meet them there. We had times in which we were scraping to go by, right? But we didn't say, let's look at our budget. We never sat down and said, okay, let's tithe less. We never had that conversation. We're going to give this because we believe in Christ. And God, would you give us abilities to help make a difference more? Now, at times, we're like, man, that's, that's a big number for us, percentage-wise, Right? I can't believe I will ever say that when I get to heaven. Oh, I gave too much. I don't believe that's true. So we work to try. I want to do this because I believe in the message of the gospel. Trying to give us an opportunity, give you an opportunity with your time you have left to partner with gospel ministry. And that's not a ploy to get money out of you. I'm not trying to get money out of you. I am trying to help you get a credit to your account. Yes, we have a roof. That leaks. Right? Yes, we have partners and places and people, but these are opportunities for us to make internal investment and to make a difference. And may the grace of God be with your Spirit. We need God's grace in all of these things. So uh, I am trying to help you, to help us to think about our life through the lens of eternity and look to make gospel impact with gospel partnerships. It is good for the kingdom of God. It is good for your soul. You make a difference. You become more like Christ. You get things accredited to your account. You make friends that will last in and through all eternity. It will be worth it, do you believe? Will you engage? So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing a song. I'll release us with a benediction. But I hope this book of Philippians has been helpful to you. You've probably forgot about what I preached six weeks ago. You probably don't remember. (laughs) Go back, read the scripture. Go back, look at these things. Because they will help you. So God, thank you for those who are here today. God, thank you for those who are listening online today. God, I do ask, Lord that your word will stick in our hearts, God. God, I pray for every person here, be it there not very much time left for those who are just starting out as young men and women, God, in various ways. God, I ask that you would help all of us take your teaching, Jesus, seriously and take the reality of your return seriously and that we would view our life through the lenses of eternity. That we would think like Paul. That we would act like Christ. That we would live because we believe and we love and we obey. Thank you for the folks here. God, you know their circumstances and situations. You know what's going on. Again, give us ears to hear. 
We ask that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth. Thank you for the opportunity to partner with what you're doing throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen.